I do not remember a year of Tisha B'Av that there were so many people who wanted to know. Honestly, have you seen how many emails there are? How many WhatsApps have gone around? Every few seconds, there's just more updates from different shiurim and this rabbi, what he said. And now there are people who are like roadies for these classes of Torah anytime that they take it on to themselves to cut and paste different snippets, all the boring parts they leave out and all the exciting parts they put in and they just post those to a thousand friends. And everybody wants to know. I don't remember a response to want to know about Tisha B'Av more than this year. That's beautiful. That's amazing. And I was wondering why. So I was sitting on a bus. I take a bus every single day. I live in Israel for the year. I'm a Rebbe in uh, Or Sameach in Israel. In the summer times, I come in. I live in Muncie, and I take a bus in every single day. And it's a bus filled with good Jews. So they pray on the bus, and then afterwards, there's a rabbi who gets up to say a few words of halacha or some chizuk. So there we are, we're wrapping up our tefillin. And the rabbi had started the nine days, and the rabbi said, Rabotai, it's the nine days, and we know terrible things happen, we have to remember. Hashem's a Rahman, Hashem only does good, he's Gomel Chesed, although we don't see it, he's amazing. And the Hasidic guy sitting next to me rolled his eyes and he said, here we go again. And that hit me. Here we go again. I, I think just to kind of speak about that rolling the eyes. It was a feeling that maybe we all have, but we're f- too afraid to share. He's sick of it. He's sick of hearing how much Hashem is a Rahman. He's sick and tired of hearing how much Chesed and how much Rahmanut. Really? Hashem, really? That really? So much chetz and so much rachmanut. So then what's going on right now? Why are we still sitting on the floors? What's going on? The first Beit HaMikdash, second Beit HaMikdash, so many tragedies. Every single one of us have way too many stories of people that we know of terrible things that are happening. But don't worry, Hashem's a Rahman. And you have to remember, He's a Rahman. He's merciful. He does hesed. He does only great things to you. Now please sit on the floor and starve today with terrible breath. Because he loves you and he doesn't want anything bad. But make sure to not sit too high and make sure to have your knee skill. And please be sure to be starving and no showers for anybody because he loves you. And I just think that our generation, after a while, we just want to know what's really going on. Because we believe in Hashem and we do believe that he's a Rahman. We just don't feel it. I think that this thirst of knowledge has come about that everybody really wants to know what Tisha B'Av is about. And they don't want to hear that Hashem loves them. I know that. Now explain. Because I'm just not seeing it. Yeah, I'm meant to believe, but I'm just not seeing it. And so we all try and we go on ish.com and this.com and learn everything.com and, and just everything. And we try to find some semblance of normalcy to take what every rabbi and what every Gemara and every Chazal has been telling us that Hashem loves us and He's a Rahman and to make it work with our own lives. Ever since we've been in fourth grade, we've been told something bad happens, you pray and you pray and you pray and then... Everything's great. Hashem will come and save you. And that's amazing, right? Everybody's going to... But then what happens when we prayed and we prayed and then just nothing? I think I deal with this question the entire year in my yeshiva. I have guys out of high school who come. They love Hashem. 
They just don't know. Where is he? I love him. It'd be great if he loved me back just a little. So, Tisha B'Av is the perfect time to get into this. Because I'm going to tell you a Gemara right now. And it's going to bother you so much. I can't wait to annoy the living daylights out of you right now with this Gemara. Listen to this Gemara in Shabbat Daf Petet. Amar Rebbe Shmuel Ban Nachmeni, Amar Rebbe Yonatan. My dichtiv, why does it say, Ki ata avinu, Ki Avraham lo yadanu, Ki Yisrael lo yikarenu, Ata asham avinu go alenu, Me olam shamecha. It says in the Pasuk, You are our father Avraham, but you don't know us. Yisrael, you don't recognize us. You, Hashem, are our father and our redeemer for forever. What does it mean that Avraham and Yaakov don't recognize us? Latid lavo in the future, Yom Kadush Baruch Avraham. In the future, that means when Hashem wants to finally bring Mashiach, Hashem is going to say to Avraham, Banecha chatuli. Your kids have sinned against me. Your kids. Now, Avraham, Avraham should be saying, but we all expect him to say. Hashem, Hashem, kerachum v'hanun, erech Should cry and scream and let's make another deal. Let's chop up more animals. Let's do something. What does Avraham answer back? Amar lefanav, rabboni shol olam. Yimchu et kudushat. Yimchu et kudushat shemecha. You're right. Obliterate them for the holiness of your name. Hashem said, wow, he, he's had a bad morning. So, Amalei Yaakov. So, Hashem goes over to Yaakov. The Havalei, Tzai Gidu Banim. Yaakov had such pain bringing up his kids. He loves his kids. Maybe at least Yaakov is going to bring some kind of a rachamim, some kind of a mercy to the table. Amalei, Hashem said to him, Banecha Chatu. Your children have sinned, Yaakov. You're right. Destroy them. Obliterate them. So that your name can be holy again. Amar, so Hashem said, Lo belo in the grandfather, I can't find any reasoning, and with the younger one, I can't find any advice. Amar lo li Yitzchak. So Hashem turns to Yitzchak. Banecha chatuli. He says to Yitzchak, your, sin, your children have sinned against me. Amar lefanav, rebono shel olam. Banai velo banecha. One second. They're my kids and they're not your kids. When your kids, when Kla Yisrael were standing by Har Sinai and they put Naaseh before Nishma, you call them your own kids, your firstborn. Now they're my kids and not your kids. I'm not going to continue in the Gemara because I only have a few minutes. But Yitzchak basically lawyers God from this point. He does a fantastic job. He says to Hashem, basically, get over it. He says to Hashem, how many years does a person live? Seventy years. Half of them are sleeping. They're not really punishable until 20. And he basically breaks it down to the years you can judge a person are 12 and a half years. Hashem, if you can't take it, I'll take those 12 and a half years and judge them favorably. This Gemara is such a just out-of-control Gemara. Why wouldn't Avraham give an answer? Why wouldn't Yaakov give an answer? They couldn't say anything. Yitzchak had to be the one. I'm not going to give you the answer today for Avraham and Yaakov. If you want their answer, do what I did. Open up the Maharal in Netzach Yisrael, Seman Yud Gimel, and give a look. He gives some great answers. I would like to talk about Why Yitzchak? I don't want to talk about why not Avraham and Yaakov. Why Yitzchak? Why was it Yitzchak that had to come through? 
what is Yitzchak? What does Yitzchak stand for? Ah, uh, Gevura. Avraham is chesed. Avraham realized that Hashem is chesed, giving, giving. Yitzchak had to be the opposite. He was din or givura, judgment. You get what you earn, not a penny less and not a penny more. And then Yaakov is a tiferet. He's a marriage of the two, of chesed and din together. When it comes to the end of days, when it comes to the times of Mashiach, Avraham, he's got nothing. Yaakov, nothing. Yitzchak, din, judgment. That's what we rely on according to this Gemara. Why? And what is it? You know, it's interesting. We're very good at finding the goodness in Hashem by Purim. Because, let's face it, it was a whole story of not seeing God. And then at the end of it, all of a sudden, Haman is hanging on the tree that he had prepared for Mordechai. All the Jews, everybody is so happy. So what do we do? We shut down our brains. We shut down our minds, right? We drink on Purim because I guess I don't understand anything either way. That's what we do on Purim. Literally, that's why we drink. Shut down that pathetic mind of yours. You thought you got it, you didn't. That's Purim. What happens when at the end of the story, the good guys don't win? What happens at the end of the story when Hashem just doesn't make it in time, apparently? I imagine the Jews in the first bed to Mikdash were standing around saying, any moment... Hashem is going to save us at any second. Only a few years before that, Sancherev, the one who came to destroy the Beit HaMikdash before Nebuchadnezzar, Sancherev came down and he wasn't playing. Sancherev knew what he was doing. He came with 180,000 troops to come and destroy all of Israel. And he succeeded in most of it. He came from the north and killed out all the first 10 tribes, kicked them out of Israel, and he came down to Jerusalem. Come on, Sanhedrin tells us he was ready to destroy Jerusalem. He was there, Yerushalayim. And right when he was about to destroy it, at the last minute, he told his soldiers, we'll wait till tomorrow. That night, the Jews of Jerusalem, of Yerushalayim, they gathered around, and they did what Jews do. They prayed, they cried their eyes out, yelling and screaming to Hashem. And Hashem listened. That night, Malach Gavriel came down, and he killed out 180,000 troops. The next morning, King Sancherev, not king anymore, he's king of nobody now. He got up and he said, Men, to your arms, to your shields, let's go make Jerusalem something of history. And the only thing that answered him was the echo of his own voice. His two children, a simple scribe by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, and a foot soldier by the name of Nebuchadnezzar were the only ones around. The Jews knew that when we pray, Hashem, He's going to come, He's going to save us, He's our Superman. At any second, He can't not make it. He can't not save us. And then Tisha B'Av comes, and in the first bed to Mikdash, and the second bed to Mikdash, they're looking around, and He wasn't there. The good guys didn't win. It's din. That, my friends, is what we call din. Judgment. On Purim, it says when Hashem heard all the 22,000 kids crying, Hashem said, what is the sound of those little animals, goats? And they said, no, it's your children. And it said, Hashem went from kisei din to the kisei of rachamim. Rachamim means God invests in you. God still does amazing things that you see it. And then, hey, lose your mind, drink, hooray, the good guys won. And then there's din. The only thing that's going to get us out of Galut is din. Grow up. Abraham didn't have a prayer. He's chesed, he's not strong enough. Oh, you want a Band-Aid? You want to put Haman on a 50-foot wooden gallow? You want to be saved for now? We'll do Rachamim to you. 
You want to be saved for forever? You want the Geula to resonate for eternity? Then the good guys don't win temporarily. It's all or nothing. And the only way we get all or nothing is if we are on the level to win. There's no savior that comes from the outside. It comes from within. Stop looking out the window enough to Shemayim for an old man with a white beard on a mule. It comes from within us. That is din. You earn it. And we all have it. The Maral writes, Why, Yitzchak? The Jew has only one reality, and that's a connection to God. He continues to say that the reason why it was Yitzchak is because Yitzchak is the Av who was Mivatel himself completely to Hashem. He gave himself up completely to Hashem. Akedat Yitzchak, giving himself up. We all have inside us that incredible godly detail. None of us, and I don't mean everybody in this room. Everybody in this room, you're amazing. You've been sitting here since I don't know when. I'm talking about to every single person on these video cameras who are out there looking to find where is the Rachmanut that everybody's taught. Hashem's a Rachman. Not today. You're right. You can't find Hashem's Rachmanu today. You want to know why? Because he's not showing it. Because he's doing din. Because today, he's expecting it to come from you. Because every single one of us have inside us that incredible detail of God. No matter how far you think anybody is. Student of mine. A Lubavitch Yid. Ah. There he was up in Cleveland. And he was wrapping up Tefillin on all these different Yidin. And it came to... He was in a certain college town over there. Incredible. He comes to this college town, and the college town had some kind of like a fair outside. And they had all these booths set up for different people selling different things. And the Lubavitchers set up their stand with their tefillin, and they're wrapping up everybody, right? I mean, they're, they're amazing. So they're calling out to people, are you Jewish, are you Jewish? And a few tables down, there are a bunch of atheists from the college who came down to sell and give off nothing. I don't know exactly what they were selling. They were selling nothing, right? They had, they had lemonade, but it was empty because there really isn't any lemonade. I, I don't know. There was just nothing. Now, I, one thing I love about the Lubavitch Yidin, my student his buddy turned to him and said, let's go wrap up the atheists. You did. They go, they go walking over to the table, and they said, who's in charge over here? As a joke, I imagine, because they went like this, and they said, nobody's in charge. <laughs> they said, no, but really, who's the guy? The guy comes down and says, yeah, it's my table. I said, you're Jewish? The guy said, yep. I said, how did you know? Ta-? He said to me, Rabbi, I've been around enough. Every single head atheist is a Jew. It's the, the rule of thumb. You didn't. Ah. We are the best when we're at our worst, apparently. So they said to the guy, did you daven shacharit yet? <laughs> the guy said, I didn't because I don't believe that. Yeah, okay. I said, but you daven shacharit yet? <laughs> the guy said, look, I'm not, I'm not interested. Come on, you guys go back to your table. We're peaceful and friendly. They weren't having it. The Lubavitchers started to talk to him about Hashem, about everything. And they got, it, they got into a fight. Nah, no, but they start to talk, a, a whole discussion, philosophical, godly discussion. He told me, Rabbi, we were standing there for about 40 minutes back and forth. Till finally my friend said, I had enough. Enough is enough talk. My friend took out his tefillin bag. He unzipped it, took the tefillin out of the bag, put him on the table, and said to the guy, if you don't believe in God, no problem. Take these, two, throw them on the floor. The guy said, what, excuse me? Take them. Throw them on the floor. There's no God either way. They're just a bunch of dumb black boxes. The guy said, look, I'm not throwing the tiffin on the floor. He said, why not? 
and all of his atheist guys are just looking around, and, and there's a crowd now. And everybody's wondering the same thing. Why not? He looked him in the face and said, because I can't. Because I can't. Now please just go back. The bomb just said, I arrest my case. Took his tefillin, put him back into the bag, they went back. That night they got a call from this guy to their Lubavitcher set up uh, headquarters, whatever, by the college. And the guy said, it's been bugging me ever since we met each other. Can we talk tomorrow? Sure, come by the office. The guy came by the next day. They spoke for about an hour and a half. And at the end, he said to them, all right, give me the tefillin. Well, what are you going to do with them? <laughs> Petrified. He's like, give me the tefillin. He took him and he wrapped him on. My students have been in touch with this guy ever since. We all have inside us, even the furthest, we have that Jew inside us. But it's about time we started to dig deep and realize that looking for the Rachmanut, you're right, we're sick of hearing it because we're at that time, we're in that place in history where the Rachmanut is ebbing out and Hashem is saying, it's time for Din. The time of Mashiach, Gemaran Sanhedrin says, Ben David is not going to show up here until everybody gives up hope. Until everybody gives up. What that means is, is that the world itself, you're not going to see much Rachmanut anymore. And everything's going to seem backwards. Yeah, it's running out. And that's why everybody wants to know what does it really mean. And what it really means is we have to become real. We have to earn it. We have to become Mashiach Jews. Mashiach Jews means we earn it on our own. We make it happen on our own. Stop looking for a handout. Become big. So many of my students who come through the yeshiva, they come in knowing nothing. And they end up like mayor. Yeah, I'm pointing to a guy in the crowd. I'm not just saying mayor, and I'll say a story. He's right here. Come like one of the Jews right here in the crowd from your community who became enormous. I don't think he eats my house anymore because I'm not kosher enough for him. <laughs> you can know so much. The thirst for knowledge is because we all want to know so much. And remaining small is not an option. Wanting Mashiach to come. We have to live it. It has to be a part of our everyday life. My father-in-law is sitting here in the crowd, and he can tell you that his grandmother, Bubby Quinn, she lived to 112 years old. She had a Mashiach dress made, a beautiful white dress. She had made that she said, I'm saving for when Mashiach comes. Her grandkids begged her, wear the dress to our weddings. And she said, how could I? How could I do that to Mashiach? He'll be here at any second. And I want to tell him that I waited. 112 years, she never wore the dress. Yidin. Those were really Yidin. They were real. We can be real. Looking for handouts is not real. Looking for Hashem in every, Hashem do this for me to become big. I'm not saying Hashem is not a Rachaman chas v'shalom. Of course he is. In every single step of our lives, Hashem is there. But on a day like today, Avraham and Yaakov, both Chesed and Rachamim, had nothing to say. Din, din saved the day. Chesed, giving to, to, to us from Hashem. Chesed is beautiful, but Hashem only gives to invest in us. We all know that we only give to an investment because we want it to give back dividends. We know we want the investment to come back and give us more. So it killed me when I heard, and please tell me that this is a lie. Please tell me that this is a lie. Please tell me that I'm about to lie, not just to this room, but to the whole world. But I was told that there were restaurants in the nine days making siyumim, so that people can eat meat during the nine days. Please tell me that's a lie. 
Are we real? Are we real? Can we not feel even a little pain for the fact that Hashem knows what we're meant to look like? Hashem has this picture of a perfect relationship between us and Him. And Hashem is saying, if only you feel. Americans are petrified to feel any kind of sensitivity. The second you go to anything, but, but, but you have to numb because I can't. I, have to, I can't. Nowadays, I run a camp. The second a kid bumps his toe, he calls his mother. Mother calls me. You know, my kid is in Hershey Park and he bumped his toe. How, how am I? But, no, but he can't. Do you know school buses today are air conditioned? Because God forbid they drive three blocks without air conditioning. Everything has to be comfortable. Everything has to be easy. Restaurants making siyumim in the 90s? Because God forbid we don't fill our fat bellies with meat because we can't. Because <laughs> Where's the din? I was invited once to go and speak. I had to drive far away to go and speak. I got up at 5.30 in the morning at the Shabbat. That, my friends, is Gehenna. But I figured to go speak somewhere. I show up to that synagogue. First of all, I show up there. They're praying at 7. It took me an hour and a half to get there. They're all sitting on chairs at 7 in the morning. Mazda, we should be sitting on the floor. Three people sat on the floor during that shacharit, myself, the rabbi, and another rabbi who came to speak from Israel. At the end, the rabbi got up, and the rabbi gave an announcement. We have a rabbi from Israel, and he was very hashuv, and then you had me. They're here to talk to you, to tell you, about Tisha B'Av, please stick around. There were 200 people in the shul. 199 walked out. I'm not making this one up. One person stayed. <laughs> there I am at 8.30 in the morning. <laughs> and the guy pulled up a chair, the one guy who doesn't have a job in the community. <coughs> and the rabbi from Israel, I, he prepared a speech for 2,000 people, and he was going to give it whether it were 2,000 people or one person. And he gave a speech. <laughs> and the rabbi spoke, and I spoke. I asked the rabbi afterwards, Maze. He said to me, they all went to work. I said, couldn't they give up work? He goes, that's not, it's not the work they couldn't give up. They don't want to feel anything. They can't be inconvenienced to just not, but it's not perfect. Din, on a day of din, of judgment, look in yourselves. Find the resolve within yourselves to know. Hashem is hurting because there's a perfect life that we could earn without His help. You don't need His help. He'll give you what you need. Stop telling Him what you need. Of course we need His help, but stop begging for it like you're going to be uncomfortable even for a moment. Learn, become big. Tisha B'Av is about Yitzchak saying to Hashem, I'll defend them because I get to laugh last and that's His name. Tisha B'Av is the greatest tragedy because it will be the greatest comedy. Because when we earn, we're all going to have the heartiest laugh possible. The name of Yitzchak, which means to laugh together, we're all going to laugh last. Because the greatest feeling in the world is when you earn something and you become something. And on your own, you get to sit back and laugh and say, Mashiach, you came here because we all earned it. Have a beautiful, meaningful fast.